discharging bulk cargo is a common procedure for offshore vessels. But it's a challenging operation. It requires attention to detail and a good awareness of safety issues. Whether the cargo is liquid or powder, before loading, the equipment, including connections and hoses, must be checked. Pressure testing may be required. Loading usually takes place at a shore base organized by the Chartra. The Chartra will determine what quantities of which materials need to be loaded. It's essential to make a loading plan with the shore based dump. Whereabouts? 60 tons of bale. In tank number 44. This will detail the piping and valves that must be used, the quantities to be loaded, and the expected timing of the procedure. The cargo hazards must be checked and measures taken to minimize the risks of spillage and personal injury. The correct PPE, personal protective equipment, must be worn. Okay. The MSDS, material safety data sheet, will indicate what's required. Liquid cargoes vary widely in their hazards. Some, like potable water, present little hazard. Others, like fuel oil or methanol, are hazardous. If the cargo is hazardous, safety and spill response equipment must be put in place, ready for use. The connection of the shore hose requires attention to proper connecting procedures. Once the loading is underway, the flow must be monitored. There must be continual checking that no leaks develop. The pressurized air used to load dry bulk products is a hazard itself. Safety glasses should be worn for any job that could involve loose chippings. The loading hoses must be secured to prevent them moving and becoming a hazard. Here, the venting hose is taken ashore and filtered. Where the venting hose is placed in the water, must be properly weighted and placed away from the jetty. All hoses, including the venting hose, must be monitored during loading. Slower rates of cargo transfer should be used at the start and near completion. Once loading is complete, the pipework and hoses must be purged, depressurized and then disconnected. The air pressure in the hose is released by a vent valve. But these valves can become blocked and must be checked and cleared if necessary before venting. On completion of loading liquid bulk cargo, the hoses will need to be drained before disconnection. Yeah, finish loading diesel and the lines went down. Before the vessel begins operations offshore, there must be a discharge plan agreed with the installation. Everyone on deck needs to know what they have to do and how long it's expected to take. Checklists may need to be completed and signed by the vessel and the installation. The type of the connection to the installation's hose must be known and understood by the deck crew. So that's the The installation will pass down a hose when they are ready. The vessel's pumps or air compressors will be needed. The hose must be long enough to allow for the vessel's movement. Ideally, it will have flotation collars. The hose should be secured so that it can be seen from the bridge and so that it will not interfere with propellers or thrusters. At night, the hose will need to be lit. Before starting either dry or liquid bulk cargo discharge, the vessel's working pressure and emergency stopping procedures must be discussed and agreed with the installation. 
The bridge must be adequately manned to cover both maneuvering the vessel and the cargo operations taking place. Personnel on deck must always be aware of what's going on around them and any potential hazards. Direct physical contact with any bulk cargo other than water must be avoided. If any cargo gets on exposed skin, it must be washed off immediately. Once the transfer is underway, the main task is monitoring the flow. If there's a problem, it's better to cause a delay by stopping the operation rather than risking pollution or injury. At all times, there must be good communication with the installation. During dry bulk cargo operations, the installation will monitor their vent. The bridge should do so too, as this can give warning of cargo blockages. With powder cargo, these are quite likely to occur. On completion of dry bulk cargo, the hoses and pipework will need to be purged, depressurized and disconnected. The air pressure must be vented from the hose. Deck crew should check that the hose is less rigid before they disconnect it. It's possible that the installation will need to backload bulk liquids, often contaminated drilling mounts. The vessel must be certain what hazardous chemicals are contained in these mounts. There must be a proper plan, agreement on pressures and emergency stopping procedures. On completion of all liquid cargo operations, the hose will need to be drained back to the vessel to ensure that there is no spillage. If hoses, pipework and tanks need cleaning, established procedures should be followed in line with MARPOL requirements. Bulk cargo transfers are demanding procedures requiring care and attention. Good risk management is essential to successful and safe bulk cargo operations. Those responsible must plan operations effectively. They need to encourage everyone to have safety, rather than speed, as the highest priority at all times. Measures must be taken to minimize the hazards of any dangerous goods. The wearing of the correct PPE, personal protective equipment, is essential in all loading and discharging operations. For safe discharging offshore, all cargo should be pre-slung. Where a color coding system is in operation for slings, the vessel should check that all slings are the correct color. The vessel needs to check that each installation's cargoes are loaded together. Loads must be placed to make working them offshore as safe and practical as possible. There must be no need for climbing on cargo units offshore. During loading, the officer on deck should check the tops of all cargo items to make certain that no loose objects such as spanners have been left there. The doors and lids of all cargo items must be closed and secure. Open top baskets and containers need to be checked to ensure that the contents are safely stored and secure. Casing and drill pipes need special attention. They must be pre-slung. They are usually loaded between deck posts 
and the vessel's crash rate. Ideally, all these items should be capped. This is to protect the threads of pipes and stop seawater getting inside casings. Failure to do this can lead to stability problems due to the free surface effect of water inside the casings. Where cargoes are in racks, the vessel should check that all items in the rack are secure. Bolts can become loose. Dangerous goods, such as gas cylinders, helicopter fuel, explosives and radioactive isotopes, must be stowed away from the accommodation with the correct separation in accordance with the IMDG code or national legislation. Good secure stowage is important for all cargoes as water on the deck can cause them to move. It's especially important for hazardous cargo. Different sectors have different weather working limitations. Once instructions have been received, the weather must be monitored. On the way to the installation, the lashings of the cargo should be checked from time to time if it is safe to do so, especially if there has been a lot of water on deck. The final decision on safe working conditions will be made by the master of the vessel. There must be a toolbox tour or safe job analysis meeting. It's ideal to have an open meeting where anyone can raise any concerns. The deck crew is informed about the agreed order of discharge. The objective is to start on the outside of the cargo and work towards the crash rail. Installation should be prevented from cherry-picking items of their cargo from inside their stove. The number of items to be backloaded must be agreed. Correct paperwork will be required for dangerous cargoes. When working downwind in poor weather, there is a constant hazard of water on deck. This can move unsecured cargo around and present a danger for the deck crew. Cargo lashings should only be released once the vessel is alongside. There must be good radio communication between the vessel and the deck foreman on the installation. Arrangements must be agreed for stopping cargo operations if the weather deteriorates or the operation becomes unsafe for any other reason. The usual procedure is for one of the deck crew to tend the hook. He grabs the pennant or stinger. The other lifts the sling and connects the hook to the sling. Once the hook is attached to the sling, the crew must withdraw to a safe position. Sometimes the deck crew have radio communication either with the bridge or directly with the crane operator. Then the crew member designated as the banksman instructs the crane operator on the installation. He then monitors the lifting. If there isn't radio communication, the banksman must use standard hand signals. Signals for the crane operator to lift must only be given when the deck crew are safe. Throughout the operation, deck crew should look out for each other's safety as well as their own. The bridge also watches them to ensure they are working safely. For backloading, the same safety procedures apply. No dangerous goods should be backloaded until the correct documentation is supplied by the installation. The installation must be asked to check that all doors and lids are closed and secure, and that there are no loose objects on top of the cargo items. There will need to be good communication between the installation and the bridge. 
The deck crew must remain in a position of safety until the cargo reaches the deck. Safe offshore cargo operations depend on good stowage of the cargo and having it fastened securely to prevent movement in all weathers. It depends on good teamwork between the bridge and deck of the vessel and between the vessel and the installation. Those on the deck and those on the bridge must always be looking out for the safety of the deck crew. Their safety must always be the first priority. Before leaving port, the vessel should ensure that it has the most recent field charts and up-to-date information about the installations it's going to. On the way to the field, the vessel must monitor the weather and the weather forecasts. The installation will be doing the same. But the final decision for going ahead with any operation will be made by the master. When about an hour old, or consistent with field procedures, the vessel notifies the installation of the vessel's ETA. After the vessel is instructed to proceed, the pre-entry 500 meter zone checklist must be gone through. Every vessel will have one as part of its safety management system. Sometimes the field or charterer may have one that they require the vessel to use. Whether a company or charterer's checklist, it will include a communications check and a full equipment check, including engines, thrusters and rudders. All propulsion machinery should be started. Steering gear systems and the changeover between control positions and manoeuvring modes need to be checked. Some fields require the vessel to be on DP, dynamic positioning. Others insist that it is not used. The vessel needs to get it right. If required, the DP checklist must be completed and the DP must be running on entry to the zone. Good, that's an important DP mode now. Okay, how's the checklist? The checklist is so are we ready for permission for the 500? Yeah. Okay. Once all checklists are completed, the vessel can request permission to enter the 500 meter zone. No defects and ask your permission to enter your 500 meters. Only when permission is given can the vessel proceed. Before entering the zone, there must be a toolbox tour. Although time may be limited, it's important that the deck crew understand the planned operations. As well as the hazards on the vessel, there are many external hazards that must be considered. There may be anchor wires and unlit anchor boards in the field. The most recent field charts will be needed. Check with the OIM, the offshore installation manager, or their designated person to ensure you have the most recent information. If subsea operations are taking place, it's unlikely that the vessel will be allowed inside the 500 meter zone. But this can happen if the installation needs the supplies urgently. Helicopter operations are another potential hazard. Helicopters almost always land and take off into the wind, and the vessel is usually asked to stand off. The vessel will be informed of any helicopter operations. Other operations that can conflict with the vessel's activities include overboard discharges, flaring, well testing, seismic work and air venting. The master must ensure that the installation's designated person keeps the vessel fully informed about all these operations, both planned and unplanned. The vessel should first maneuver to a safe position outside the radius of the installation's cranes. 
and at least 50 meters off the installation. The master should then assess the situation to ensure that working conditions are safe before proceeding to the position for cargo operations. Inside the zone, the engine room as well as the bridge should be continually manned. It's best practice to work down weather from the installation. If the installation requires the vessel to work up weather, a further risk assessment may be needed. It's possible that the vessel may need to tie up to the installation. This is a challenging procedure. The vessel will be moored either stern to or alongside. Regular checking of the mooring ropes is essential. These situations can cause considerable wear on the mooring ropes. The personnel on the bridge must maintain a constant listening watch on the field VHF channel. The vessel must be ready to change position or stop operations at short notice. Stopping operations may mean leaving the 500 meter zone. Working inside the 500 meter zone is demanding for everyone on board. Many operations may be going on at the same time. So it's important that everyone is told about any changes to the plan. The deck crew need to keep alert. They must be prepared to stop or alter what they are doing at short notice. Either because the weather has deteriorated or because the installation requires it for any reason. Proper planning, good communications and putting the safety of everyone on board as the main priority will help to make these operations safe and successful. controlling the operation. The risk of personal injury is always present. The first defense against this is keeping to proper planned procedures. Personal protective equipment, PPE, is also important. This includes a hard hat with a chin strap, safety footwear, high visibility jackets, and gloves. It can also include eye protection. Flotation devices will be required on vessels with open decks. These must be put on correctly so that they do not come off should the wearer fall into the water. There is often water on deck, so slips, trips and falls are a constant hazard. The deck crew should look out for each other's safety and be prepared to stop the operation if their safety is jeopardized. Generally, for hooking up pre-slung cargoes, a team of two is required. Deck crew must go to a position of safety during actual lifting. One crew member is designated as banksman and signals to the crane operator on the installation. When working cargo or anchor handling, the vessel will usually be working down weather. Even a small swell can cause water to come on board and wash the crew up the deck. In difficult weather conditions, remember the old nautical saying, one hand for yourself and one for the vessel. When deck operations have to be carried out at night, effective illumination of the working area is essential. In anchor handling, towing, and also mooring operations, everyone on deck, as well as those commanding the deck crew, must be aware that ropes and wires can break. So when equipment and lines are under tension, everyone should be in a position of safety. Anchor handling involves bringing anchors, buoys, wire, chains, and other equipment on deck 
The mud and water that comes on deck with them makes the deck slippery and increases the risk of slips, trips and falls. For this reason, the deck should be cleaned as soon as possible. If you are unsure about how to carry out a procedure, do not just carry on. You may be putting yourself and others on board at risk. Asking for help is good for safety and an effective method of learning. If you are ever asked to do something you consider to be unsafe, stop the job and speak to a senior officer. The senior officers should plan the operations efficiently and issue their commands in a positive, calm manner. Complying strictly with proper procedures helps to minimize the risk of personal injury. Avoid cutting corners. Always think about where you are standing. Be aware of mooring points, uneven decks, and other trip hazards. In all situations, it's important to work calmly and never rush around. No job is so urgent that it's worth risking your life or your safety. You, your colleagues and the vessel will all benefit from you carrying out your work calmly and correctly. Make safety your first priority while working on deck. Schedules are intense. Fatigue and tiredness represent potential problems for everyone on board. Tiredness is due to long or hard physical effort. It's resolved by rest and sleep. This is not always easy on a constantly moving vessel. Fatigue builds up over time. It includes both physical and mental effects and results in reduced physical and mental capacity. It can be difficult to recover from. The effects of fatigue are dangerous in any demanding job. Fatigue affects everyone, regardless of experience, skill, age, knowledge and training. It can affect an individual's reaction time, coordination and decision making. The senior officers on board need to be aware of this possibility. Records show that working at night is associated with reduced alertness. This is especially likely at the end of a shift and towards the end of a tour. Deck crew can be involved in hard physical work and so are at risk of tiredness. Over time, this can also build up into fatigue. Those on the bridge are at risk of fatigue when manoeuvring the vessel for long periods while close to installations. To avoid tiredness and fatigue, all personnel must use their off-duty time to relax and sleep. There is international legislation that restricts working hours on ships and so helps to combat fatigue. Everyone needs to know and comply with the working hours set out in the STCW Convention and the Maritime Labour Convention. Many vessels are chartered and manned for 24-hour working. If not, personnel must know the contractual arrangements for their vessels. Occasionally, installations will ask for longer work hours than the vessel is chartered for. Masters should put the welfare of their crews first. If they believe that crew fatigue will increase the hazards of any requested operation, they must say no and give their reasons. As well as knowing the legislation, the human element is equally important. They want to score on site more as well. How do you feel about going in? Because I know I'm going to have to sleep last night. Yeah. 
Everyone must make the best use of their off-duty time to get enough rest. Senior officers must ensure that everyone, including themselves, does that. Tired and fatigued crew members are more likely to suffer personal injuries and make poor decisions with the potential to endanger the crew, the vessel, installations and the marine environment. Everyone needs to be aware of the effect of continual heavy weather on personnel's ability to sleep. During safe job analysis and toolbox meetings, senior officers should watch out for any signs of fatigue in their personnel. But everyone should know how to recognize the signs of fatigue in themselves and their colleagues. The danger signs include difficulty staying awake, difficulty in concentrating, slowness and clumsiness. Fatigued individuals become more forgetful, they get headaches and feel giddy. Other signs show the psychological effects of fatigue. People become unusually irritable and less talkative. They can become depressed and show increased antisocial behavior. If anyone believes that fatigue is affecting them or a colleague, they should do what they can to get themselves or the individual some rest. The person concerned must use their maximum allowance of rest time to sleep and relax. Crew members should inform their supervisor if they believe that fatigue is lowering their effectiveness. In the longer term, reducing fatigue is helped by eating healthily, smoking less, and reducing caffeine consumption. Fatigue is dangerous offshore because it leads to slower responses and poor judgment of distance, speed, time and risk. Individuals can become preoccupied with a single task and overlook more important issues. They become less vigilant. Officers should ensure that everyone, including themselves, gets enough rest and makes best use of their off-duty time to minimize fatigue. Everyone needs to be aware of the symptoms of fatigue. Remember that if you are suffering from fatigue, you have the potential to endanger yourself, your colleagues, your vessel and the marine environment. Watch this video again, read the workbook and discuss these issues with your colleagues.